What's up? Man. We are in a series of lessons where we're looking at Song of Songs. If you have your Bibles, turn over to chapter 5. We're going to be in chapter 5 tonight. Um, I hope you're enjoying uh, digging through God's Word. This is, this is a book that, that we don't spend a whole lot of time in. Um, and so it's refreshing to be able to look at, at, uh, at new things and learn new things. A common lie that young adults believe is, what they, is that what they do before marriage won't affect their relationship after they're married. And quite frankly, that's just not true. The reality is that how we view sex and the opposite sex will determine so much of our relational health and also affect our ability to accurately see and understand relationship cues as we process the likelihood of a potential life partner. What we're going to talk about tonight is, uh, the title of this lesson is Love and Rejection. Uh, This series is entitled God and Sex uh, because we're not just talking about uh, sexual intercourse, we're not just talking about the act of sex itself, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about um, the, uh, the relationship that God has with us, we're also looking at the relationship that we have with each other, and as you are um, contemplating your future, thinking about being with someone for the rest of your life in the covenant of marriage, I know that's a common theme, uh, a lot of people talk about dating, um, but there's not really a whole lot of dialogue about marriage, in my opinion, and uh, I think that dating is a, is a noble subject, it's a good thing, thing to talk about, but in order for you to know what to shoot for, um, it's important to talk about the destination, right? Uh, in order for us to know how to get where we want to go, we need to be able to know where we're going first, right? We can't just wander our way there. So we're going to talk about sex tonight. We're going to talk about, more particularly, the relationship, the dynamic between a man and a woman um, emotionally. We're going to talk about the unhealthy parts of relationships and how they affect our ability to have real intimacy. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, so far in this series, uh, sex is not the pinnacle of marriage. Sex is a idol in our culture. It's something that is held up and it is polished and it's put in front of us because it gets our brain tingling. But sex is actually not the main part of marriage. The main purpose of marriage, if you remember, detailed out in Ephesians chapter 5, is twofold. The husband is to die for his wife, like Christ died for the church and gave himself for her. He's an example of Jesus dying for his bride. And the wife, on the other part, is supposed to submit to her husband as a picture of Jesus' submission to the calling of the Father. And she displays the loving submission and trust that it take, took for Jesus to be able to give his life fully, not just his physical life, but his life purpose to the Father. And so the two of them come together in the, in the covenant bond of marriage, and they display the gospel. The number one job of marriage is to display the gospel. It is not to have sex. It is not to have babies. It is not even companionship. The number one purpose for marriage, as, pertaining, as pertained by Scripture, is to display the relationship that Jesus has with creation. So that means that as we are looking at relationships, that needs to be our fundamental understanding with how we deal with each other. You'll find as you, as you get on with life, as you find that person that God has for you potentially, guys, you will realize that um, after you're married for a while, this sweet woman that you love so much, eventually you realize she's a dirty sinner. And likewise, you ladies who see your man and you think, oh my goodness, this is my white, my white knight, my knight in shining armor. Wow. He's a dirt bag sometimes. And you begin to realize that we have to be patient with each other. We've got to communicate with each other. Remember, we've got three characters in this, in this uh, book of Song of Songs. We're going to look at two of them tonight. We have the bride. We have the woman. Her name is Shulamith. Um, and we have the shepherd boy, her lover, her husband. So we're going to pick up right into the text. We've got a lot to get through tonight, so we're going to get on with it. Beginning in verse 1, he says, uh, remember, okay, let me, I've got to recap here. Last chapter, last week, we looked at um, he was looking at his bride, and he was excited to be able to be with her physically and, and intimately, and so he was describing her. We talked about all those different elements. So beginning in verse 1, we see him coming to the realization of his love. 
It says in verse 1, it says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. Remember, garden is a metaphor for her sexuality. I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have picked my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. The groom described his love and has now tasted the sweetness of his bride, and he's satisfied. Notice something here, that he accepts the gift of her love, and he acknowledges that her garden belongs to him. One of the elements of marriage is that Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that when a, when a woman and a man are married together in a covenant relationship, that they no longer belong to themselves, they belong to each other. So I do not belong to myself, my wife owns me. She does not belong to herself, I own her. We are, we are each other's possession in the same way that our relationship with Christ, we no longer have independence. We are fully His, and He is fully ours. And, the, and in the wisdom of that relationship, we display the goodness of heaven. He says, I gather my myrrh with my spices. This language uh, describes the luxurious experience of consummating their marriage. Now, there's a lesson here in the preparation for a couple for marriage. Too many wedding nights have been spoiled by lack of understanding by both men and women about making love and what it should look like. These expectations are determined by worldly assumptions about sex through media, pornography, books, and music. As couples prepare for marriage, it's important for their premarital counseling to cover sexual activity and, frame, and, and to frame godly expectations for their relationship to be healthy. What you learn and how you frame how you frame the expectations of your sexual relationship will be carried into marriage. Okay, so if all you know is what you see on a, on a screen performed by two actors in a, in a scenario that has been directed to get the most, the most powerful stimuli into your brain, this is not reality. It's abusive and it's wrong because it bends your perception about someone else. And what it does is it turns your beautiful spouse that God's given you into an object to be traded and discarded. And so what, what, what we have here is we have a, a, a husband and a wife enjoying each other, and they have been completely satisfied, but the reality is that they have saved themselves both in expectation and in reality for marriage. And so we hear the narrator speak at the end of verse 1. He says, eat, friends, drink, and imbibe deeply, O lovers. There's two ways that scholars look at this phrase. One is the announcement of the groom of the consummation of the wedding, uh, and the other is a comment from God watching the two make love with each other. In regard to the announcement of the groom, in other words, the groom would just be announcing that they've consummated. In, uh, in Old Testament culture, in ancient culture, what would happen in uh, the Hebrew world is that um, once the, the wedding has been, ha- once the wedding has happened and they consummate the wedding, they would save the bed sheets. In Deuteronomy, it talks about... Uh, that uh, the husband would take the bed sheet that had the evidence of their lovemaking, both the, both the, whatever the fluid product of, of their lovemaking, and he would give it to his father-in-law. Now, this seems kind of weird, but, think, but follow me, okay? <laughs> so what he'd do is he'd give it to his father-in-law. And what this was, this is proof. This is proof that his, that his bride, not only that she belonged to him, but also it's proof of her purity before, before marriage. Because the first time that you make love, many times it will produce blood, it will produce different things because it's a new way that your body has worked, to, worked uh, and it's, uh, it's unfamiliar. So a lot of times the woman will bleed some. And so what this did was this is an insurance policy that if that man came and was a bad steward of that woman, he could come to his father-in-law and he could try to renounce her as his bride. The father-in-law could pull out that sheet and say, oh no, she is yours. You've claimed her. She has been marked by you. There's no going back. This is a way that God had laid out within his law to protect women from being used and abused and traded like property. See, one of the lies of our world is that God in the Bible doesn't care about femininity. It doesn't care about human sexuality. But think about that. In a generation that uses sex as a caricature of truth, God's word from the beginning has been protecting women has been protecting sexuality, has been protecting our value, our intimacy with one another. It's more likely that this is a comment made from heaven as God looks over the man and the woman as they enjoy each other. The first reason of this is because the voice changes in the text, in the Hebrew. 
uh, from the man to a third party, like a narrator. And the second reason is that it is a natural response from God who told Adam and Eve in the garden to enjoy themselves, and they felt no shame in their nakedness together. The use of the word for friends here is in the plural form of the words that, that the lovers have used for each other, my dear friend, my lover, my companion, my sweet friend. And so many scholars point to the Creator God calling the lovers by name and endorsing their love, saying, enjoy each other, my sweet friends. This is not a perverted phrase. This is God blessing the physical relationship between a man and a woman. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to protect our sexuality. Because God looks on a relationship between a husband and a wife, and it's something that he enjoys because he knows that this has been a gift given from him to them, not just to grow together, but also uh, to, to grow their, their, their family. One of the things that is, uh, that is odd is that generally nakedness is a shameful thing, no matter where you go in the world. There are some places in the world that nakedness is, is uh, seen in different ways, but one of the things within a, within a marriage relationship is that nakedness is something that should be uh, unshameful. And uh, the reason is because this is the most intimate part of who we are as people. That's why modesty is such a big deal. Modesty is not about causing someone else to stumble. Modesty is about protecting the integrity of your body so that it can only be shared with the, with the person that God has given you to share it with, right? Our generation likes to display our bodies because we think it's, it's good because it gives us attention. But what does that do? We're just stoking our own pride. I have two daughters, and we talk about modesty some. We don't talk about it a lot. But one of the things that, I've, that I have been um, very intentional about communicating with them is that modesty is not about making sure that a dude doesn't have bad thoughts about you. Modesty is about not drawing, drawing undue attention to yourself because you want to be known for your reputation and your godliness, not your physical display of your body. Right? If people can't see past my body, then they're missing the whole point of my existence. My point is to, is to is the purpose of my life is to point people to God, to point God, point people to heaven. Another thing that's important here, before I move on, the reason why pornography and other sexual sin is so addicting is because the way that God has programmed the human body is that at the moment of climax, when a person has an orgasm, what happens is that God has programmed our bodies to give a cocktail of hormones at that moment. Oxytocin, epinephrine, adrenaline, a number of other hormones are released at that moment. And what, what that does, particularly with oxytocin, is it causes us to bond emotionally with whatever is in front of our faces, whatever our eyeballs are on. So what, what God has done is he has programmed our bodies literally to sync up with each other at the moment of having intercourse. He does this so that he can bond a husband and a wife together. Oxytocin is the same hormone that a mother secretes from her own brain whenever she is nursing her, her child that she just bore. God did that on purpose so that she could, number one, forget the pain of her childbirth, but also to bond her to that child. That's why postpartum hormones can be such a roller coaster for our ladies, because God is literally working their brain to bond with this child. And the same thing happens when a, when a husband and wife have sex with one another, because when they're looking at each other making love, God is literally bonding them together. So what happens when we watch pornography and we masturbate? That same happens. We bond with that screen, right? We bond with the images on that screen. Why do people gravitate towards specific adult porn stars? Why do they gravitate towards certain fetishes? Because they have bonded physiologically with what's in front of their eyeballs. Something we've talked about before is that an addiction to pornography is just as powerful, if not more powerful, than an addiction to cocaine. The same chemical response happens in the brain. So when God says... He looks at these lovers and he says, yes, enjoy yourselves. Drink of your love. Enjoy one another. This is a good thing because it reinforces the, the bond between a husband and a wife. So it is a good thing, not something for us to, to giggle about and to, and to dismiss or to devalue. Well, now we're going to move into the relationship piece. We're starting in verse 2. I'm going to read verses 2 through 6, and then we'll pick this apart. Now, this is the second dream sequence that we've seen in this story. 
Shulamith is going to be sleeping, and she's going to um, she's going to have a dream, and she's going to uh, have an experience here. Start beginning in verse two. She says, "I was asleep, but my heart was awake. O voice, my beloved is was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is what is full of dew, my locks with the damp of the night. I've taken off my long sleeved garment. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again?" My beloved sent forth his hand through the opening. My feelings moaned for him. I arose to open, my, open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened my beloved, opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and passed by. My soul went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called to him, but he did not answer me. It begins by saying, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. Shulamith recounts, her second dream about her lover, she describes being somewhere between being asleep and awake. This is the, the weird haze of coming out of a dream. Possibly she, this is the early morning, the place between heavy sleep and the beginning of a new day. So she hears, she says, it's the voice of my beloved. As she begins to wake up, she hears the voice of her, of her lover outside. He'd come to her, he had come to visit her, come to see her either for an unexpected rendezvous or after a long day of looking after his responsibilities. He knocks and he says, Open for me, my sister, my love. After coming home, he finds himself locked out. So he calls to her, asks her to let him in. The emphasis in this episode is not that they are married or unmarried, but on a difficulty in their relationship. He describes her, he says, My sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. First the beloved called for his maiden, but the sound of his voice wasn't enough to persuade her to open the door. Then he affectionately praises his maiden with each of these warm and complimentary terms. Yet, this also was not enough to persuade her. He calls her a few things. This is important for us to notice. He calls her my sister. One suggestion with this title is, 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 uh, is permanence, that this is someone who is connected to him permanently. A sister is... Uh, just like we have sisters and brothers in the faith. She is his wife, she is his lover, but she also is his sister. My wife is my lover and my friend, but she is also my sister in heaven, in Christ. So he praises her. This is a permanent relationship. One remains a sister forever, and that is how long the beloved wanted to be connected to his maiden. So he's, he's, so he's calling her a permanent name. He says, my darling, my dove. Doves are some of the few animals that mate for life. This title is for his love, for, for his love is a symbol of their faithfulness and the fidelity of their relationship. He calls her his perfect one. The language points to her ethical and moral blamelessness. He's praising her for her character. And he says this, he says, For my head is covered with dew. The last appeal from the lover is to describe his condition after seeking her out. He says, I've been out all night taking care of my sheep. I have the dew on my head fresh from the morning. I'm exhausted. I need to see you. Not because he wants to express himself carnally to her, but because he, he desires to be with his friend. He had spent the night away, and he was excited to see her. But she won't open the door. And yet for all this, the maiden doesn't open the door for the beloved to allow him to enter in. Why would she make him wait outside? Look at these verses in verses 3 through 6. She begins by saying, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? In response to the warm appeal of her beloved, the maiden answers only with excuses. She says, I was come comfortable in my bed, so how could I get out? I've already gotten ready for bed. I've already washed my face, and I've already under the covers, and I feel so nice in bed. Why would I get up? Why would I inconvenience myself or be bothered by having to get up and get around and get dressed to go answer the door, preparing herself to sleep again? She says, I've washed my feet. How can I defile them again? Man, I'm already tucked in. She's more interested in her love, in her comfort than her love. This is a fundamental truth here. That a committed relationship is built through communicating and working through these moments. You will find, as you find yourself in an actual permanent relationship, that this is a reality. Intimacy, being with someone, is inconvenient. You're gonna, you will find as you are as you've been with someone for a long time, Lindsay and I will have been married for 19 years in a couple of weeks. That's our anniversary. And once the honeymoon wears off, what happens is you fall into the macaroni and cheese of life. 
The regular humdrum, okay, I worked, I'm tired, I want to go to bed. Oh, but you still want to be with me, you still want to talk. You have, you, I, 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 just, I just need to sleep, right? But there is this incessant need to be connected together. And so when one person is exhausted, the other person wants to connect. And while the other person, finally, they want, to, they're exhausted, the other person wants to connect. So this is back and forth. So she's, ha- she's living out a very real scenario. She's like, I've already settled in. I just want to go to bed. I just want to sleep. But you're bothering me. Can I just get a minute? We see in marriages, we see this in marriages for both men and women. A marriage is a lot of work that requires sacrifice of comfort. How many husbands and wives desire their spouses only to be dismissed for the sake of their comfort? We see this, finally, in the manifestation of relationships where people are married for a number. They start counting a number. We've been married for 45 years, 50 years, 60 years, but they sleep in separate bedrooms. They sleep on separate floors of the house. There's no intimacy. There's no friendship. But we're counting our number. That is the end of this road right here, of dismissing the responsibility to be intimate with each other, to be available for each other. She says, how can I? This is is a a phrase that's often used in songs uh, in the ancient world. It's connected to mourning and lamentation. His invitation makes her feel more like going to a funeral than an invitation to be with a sweet friend. Imagine that. I would rather go to a funeral than hang out with you. She doesn't see him as a sweet part of her life. She sees him as a burden, as a center of anguish. She talks about her robe. This is the garment that was worn next to the skin, not the garment of the outside that we talked about in chapter 4. This is the inside. This is her underwear. This is her bed clothing. Um, one, one, uh, one scholar commented, that she lies unclothed in the bed. And it catches the, pers- the, the precise meaning of comfort. Now maybe, maybe she was simply not willing to be inconvenienced by him. Maybe she was just irritated by the intrusion. Whatever the reason might have been, she took her time answering the door. This is a picture of a person who takes the sacrifice of their self-proclaimed dearest friend for granted. It's the epitome of a self-centered pride. Her problem wasn't that she didn't go to the door, but that she did it so slowly and reluctantly, making excuses all along the way. This attitude shows an insensitive spirit. Here's another key truth here about marriage. That as married life gets more tiring and busy, there's a temptation to put your spouse at the bottom of the priority list. The reality is that one day your spouse will be the only person in the say in your life. Your children are great, but they will leave. Parents can be encouraging, but they will die and you will move aw- or you will move away from them. Your spouse should be the primary human relationship in your life. It's important to ask this question about anyone that you're thinking about pursuing a relationship. Okay, write this down. Am I willing to still love this person even when they take me for granted? Am I willing to still love this person even when they take me for granted? Man, this sounds really familiar, but we'll get to that. She goes on. She says, My beloved put his hand on the latch of the door. Shulamith could hear her lover at the door, and his final attempt was to enter and to check in, but so he checks the door and I'm to see if it's locked. Maybe, maybe she left the door unlocked, maybe. But she realizes it's bolted. And so she comes to the door. So she says, I rose to open for my beloved, but it wasn't, but uh, he wasn't there. It wasn't that she refused to open the door, it's just that she took too long. She delayed out of self-interest and self-indulgence. She was really, really comfortable in that bed. Now this uncovers something. I want you to notice that the groom doesn't kick the door in. He doesn't force his way into the room. He doesn't demand and pound on the door, you owe me this, you belong to me, X, Y, Z. He offers an invitation, and it's up to her to accept it. Now, this uncovers something that makes us uncomfortable. Gentlemen, if you are in relationship with a woman, and you are forcing her, if you are pushing the envelope to be with you physically, you are abusing a daughter of heaven. It's inappropriate, and it's wrong. A godly man is known not just by his physical strength, but more importantly, by the self-restraint of his spirit. 
Even when you are married, you are not entitled to your wife because she is a human being. She is a person. God has given us strength in physical ways. He's given us strength in different ways. He's given them strength in different ways. And when we abuse those things that God's given us that is supposed to be a help for our mate, what happens is we take advantage of what God has designed. Our place is to be caretakers and protectors, not to be abusers. So she touches the door, and it drips with myrrh. She finally got out of bed. She came to check the door. She noticed that he was gone, but the handle is covered in perfume. This is another reminder of his love for her. You see, in the ancient world, it was common for doors and for door latches to be anointed by perfume. It was a love note that he left for her. According to one scholar, it was a custom for some of these ancient people to do this anointing um, to, to, to leave a token of affection. Now notice something, his response. His response isn't in anger. It's not of objection, but simply of a non-threatening display of love. This is kind of, kind of cheesy, but you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the movie Princess Bride. Many of you guys know that, that, that movie, right? So at the very first, whenever Buttercup is with Wesley, and she's like, she's total just mean to him. She's a total turd to him, right? And what is his response? He's like, you know, uh, farm boy, go do this. Go do that. Go do that. And what's his response? As you wish. What was he really saying? I love you. Notice our shepherd boy's response. She's been a total just, oh, man. There's a word that we could use, but we're not going to use it in church. <laughs> but notice, he is, he's, not, he's not abusive, he's not angry, he just is gentle. This is a wonderful picture of the way that a husband should respond when he feels disrespected by his wife. Instead of angrily demanding respect, he should be instead display his love for her in a non-threatening way and wait for the response of love for her. Now notice, she opens the door, says, I open for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and he was gone. When she finally came to the door, shaking off her previous self-indulgence and laziness and perhaps desire to control the relationship, she found that her beloved was gone. She was too late. She opens the door, she can smell the myrrh, she can smell the perfume, and she realizes, she looks around, he's not there. Man, this uncovers another key truth. That the same unintentionality that you show in your dating relationship will continue into your marriage. If you're not purposeful, if you're not purposefully living now, you won't purposefully live later. And the reason why I say that, what that means, is that she took for granted that he was always going to be there. She took for granted that, oh yeah, he's out there. Yeah, that's my guy. You know, whatever. He just. You know, he loves me. This is it's fine. I can treat him however I want. But you know what? He's not there all the time. So I want you to think about this in your relationships. If you're not thinking, intentionally pursuing the display of the gospel in your relationships, you need to rethink your relationship. Every couple that I do premarital counseling with, I encourage them to have short engagements. If you're dating for three, four, five years, don't do it. Don't do it. And the reason why I say that is because you're not being intentional with the reason why you're together. All the, we can go over the whole, whole line of excuses. I got to finish school first. I got to make sure I have a job first. I got to make sure I got a house first. I got to have a car first. All this stuff, right? All these reasons. Okay, well, tell me, what of all those things can God not provide for you? If God has called you to marry a person, what makes you think that Matthew 6 doesn't apply to you? That he can't pay your bills and take care of you? If God's told you to do something, you need to do it. Because Paul tells us in his, in his, uh, in his letters that we, it, was, it is better for us to be married than to be living in sin. What happens when we date somebody for five, six, seven years? Oh, and then we're going to be engaged for another three years. I might as well be standing ankle deep in gasoline, striking matches and throwing them around. Like, I'm not going to get burned. This is fine. Everything's fine, Right? Get on with it. She took for granted what she had. And guys, gentlemen, let me tell you, if you love that girl and you're going to marry the girl, marry her. Stop messing around. 
Be a freaking man and sack up and do it. If you want to marry the girl, tell her, hey, this is my goal for our relationship. I want to get married. I want to display the gospel in my life. I want to give my life for a woman. If you're not into that, that's fine. I'm not going to waste your time. Ladies, if you're looking for a guy to share your life with, to give your life to, have the same conversation. This whole like, well, you know, I'll have my friend talk to him and this thing. We'll talk about this and do this thing over here. We'll kind of just keep things ambiguous over here. Just have the conversation. Just get it over with. Get it done. Right? And if you're not purposefully moving towards a goal of, of displaying the gospel in your relationship, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's like we're going to hang out together. We're really attracted to each other. And we know that, yeah, Jesus is important, but we're really more focused about the physical side of our relationship. Your relationship is built on sand. Because eventually, guess what? Your young bodies, they change. You know what? That person, those things that you just dismiss, like, wow, she's really a pill. I really don't like it when she does X, Y, Z. How she treated that waitress or that person or that, that, other, that other small person. I really don't like that. Why would you marry that woman? Ladies, if the guy's disrespectful to you and he's disrespectful to people who can't help themselves, the little people, why would you be with them? You want to know a really good test? Guys, Watch how she talks about her dad. If she talks about her dad like he's a total just ignoramus, she disrespects him and talks about how terrible he is, guess what? When she is now familiar with you and the new, the new wears off, guess how she's going to treat you? Ladies, watch how he treats his mama. Because as soon as he is Done with the shine with you, guess how he's going to treat you? Is he loving? Is he affectionate? Does he serve? Is she loving? Is she affectionate? Does she serve? These are important things. She sees that he's gone. She calls to him, but he didn't answer. Now the roles are reversed. We've seen him call for her, but now she's calling for him and she can't, get, she can't find him. She's waited too long to respond, and it's actually worked against her own self-interest. There's a picture here. Remember, this, this also displays not only the relationship between a man and a woman, but also the relationship between Jesus and the church. Jesus says, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The day is coming when the clock will run out. And for some of you, you're laying there under the covers of your sin, and you're just stretching. It's so nice. It feels good. And the Savior's at the door. The number one deception is not that you can do it, that you are capable or smart, that the devil exists or doesn't exist, or that Jesus exists or doesn't exist. The number one deception is that you always have more time. Jesus is knocking. Do you trust Him? This also points to relationships. And when we take our relationships for granted, we dismiss their value. The woman was not valuing her man's pursuit of her, and so she dragged her feet. If you're in a long-term relationship that's not purposefully moving forward to marriage, you are devaluing your partner and stringing them along. Let the goal be said and let it be stated and live it. Don't just date for fun. You're just striking matches ankle deep in gasoline. And so she goes to search. Look at verses 7 and 8. The watchmen who go about the city found me and they struck me and they wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I call you to solemnly swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him that I am sick with love. 
Now, we see, we've seen her with these watchmen before. Before, she, she blazed right past them to go find her love, but she runs into them again, and they're not so dismissive. It says that they struck her, and they wounded her. In their dream, the maiden sought, to, to, sought and called for her beloved, but he wasn't there, extending her search to the streets of the city. This is similar to what we've seen before, but it's different. Since this happened in a dream, it's and not in reality, it may reflect a maiden's guilt over not responding to him. She might be thinking, oh my goodness, this is getting worse and worse and worse. The keepers of the walls who took, their, took her veil um, speaks to her innocence, her purity. It's probably better understood to, uh, to think of not as a wedding, a wedding veil, but as a shawl that, that a woman would use to cover her hair. In the Middle Eastern culture, a woman's hair is an intimate part of her body, and so they always cover it. So she said, these men have taken from me my decency and my modesty. Her dismissal of her love has robbed her of her respect. She had a godly man waiting for her, pursuing her, and she she took it for granted. And now she has to explain, he's gone. If he's so great, if he's so awesome, why is he not with you? She says, tell him I'm lovesick. Now Shulamith... She becomes desperate as she regrets what she's done to her love, and now she's lovesick. Now, this is different than before. Before we saw this word lovesick, but it meant that I was enraptured in love. I was drunk on love. I was passionately pursuing someone. But here, it means the aching of an absence. You see, in the beginning, sin makes us slow to obey God because it's warm and it feels inviting, but in the end, it bites us. One commentator put it this way about spiritual life and how we may say that there are some sicknesses that, are, uh, that plague us all. The sin sickness, when the soul hates sin but wants nothing to do with it, or self-sickness, when the soul comes to hate self-indulgence, self-seeking, self-exalting, and self-reliance of every sort. Love sickness, that first type, when the believer is so deeply moved by the love of God that they feel they can hardly bear it, and then finally, love sickness of the second type, where the believer feels distanced. They have distant form or deserted by Jesus. They feel like they've been disconnected from him. Charles Spurgeon described this second type of love sickness in this way. He said, It is the longing of a soul, then, not for salvation, and not even for the certainty of salvation, but for the enjoyment of present fellowship with him who has her soul's life, her soul's all. It is a panting after communion. In other words, what's happening is she's realizing, yes, he is still my husband, but I realize I have offended my relationship with him. This is the same thing that happens with us as believers when we take, we take for granted our relationship with the Lord and we begin to compromise ourselves when we begin to snuggle into our little sin bed and we're like, oh yeah, this is fine, this is fine. And then we realize that we have finally comforted ourselves into separation from God. Think about the words of David who prayed, said, God, please restore to me the joy of my salvation. He wasn't praying for salvation. He was praying for the joy to return. That he had found himself compromised by sin. He was still a son of heaven, but he found himself separated from God because he had offended an almighty God. He had taken advantage of a love that had been poured on him without any restraint. Some of you may have already experienced this, where you know that you're saved, you know that you have a relationship with Christ, and yet you find yourself miserable because you are trapped in something that you feel you can't get out of. See, sin affects all parts of our nature. It affects our body, our soul, and our spirit. And while our spirit may be secure in our relationship with Christ and we will be going to heaven, sin can still affect us emotionally and physically. And so the separation from God can cause distress. Now, these last few verses, we're going to go through these quickly. So the daughters of of Jerusalem, they respond to her. They ask her about her beloved. Verse 9, what is your beloved that he is more than any other beloved, O most beautiful among women? Now, bear in mind, she just got out of bed, so her hair's a mess. Face isn't on. Probably not wearing the right outfit. They call her the fairest of women. Man, I don't know if they're taunting her or what, but that's, that's cruel. What is your beloved that he is more than any other beloved. Thus you call us to solemnly swear. She says, what is your beloved more than others? The daughters respond that the woman's desperate request is with a legitimate question. Why is he so special? Well, she's going to go on and she's going to tell us. Look at verse 10. 
My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, lifted up as a banner among ten thousand. His head is like gold, fine gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water washed in milk and sitting in their setting. His cheeks are like the bed of spices, towers of sweet-scented herbs. His lips like lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is a plate of ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness. He is wholly desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughter of Jerusalem. She begins by describing him from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes. Now, um, this is uncommon in ancient literature. Typically, a woman is described. We can see this in art throughout history. That typically, you don't see a whole lot, of, whole lot of statues in art of men because the male form, let's be honest, is not that remarkable. There's a reason why typically it's the female form that's displayed in art, right? But she displays the characteristics of her man. She says that he's ruddy. Most commentators take this simply to mean that he is a man's man. This is the same word in Hebrew that's used in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. The word Adam is the Hebrew noun which means masculine. Her lover's manly. It's admire, it's, it is uh, with admiration that she looks at him. Of a man's greatness, it's strong, it's mo- he, it, it motivates her, it motivates all those who see him because he's an accomplished person. Now, take these pieces here. That his head is like the finest of gold, his locks are wavy. The woman saw that her man was handsome. His hair shine like the finest gold with beautiful wavy locks. It says that his eyes are, are like doves by the rivers of waters. His cheeks like the bed of spices. His hands and rods of gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, an excellence of cedars. There's a numbers of, number of things that we can go in here, but I love, there's a, there's a writer from last century. His name is Watchman Nee. He's dead now. Um, but he described these characteristics uh, thinking about Jesus. That he was white and ruddy, ruddy, uh, the ruddy complexion of perfect health. He is a man's man. He is brawny, as you could say. This indicated that he was vibrant and full of life and power. His head is like the finest of gold. This is the description of his divine attributes. He possessed God's life and God's glory. His locks are wavy and black as a raven, an indication of his everlasting vigor and power. His eyes are like doves. Eyes are the seat of expression, and the description also speaks of an intimacy known by the spouse. His cheeks are like the bed of spices and banks of the scented herbs. These same cheeks had undergone much shame and despite. No wonder then that such a believer as as this one looked upon his cheeks as a bed of fragrant spices and herbs. The idea is that uh, in the ancient world or even in the Middle East, even today, a man is known by his beard, that in the, in the Middle Eastern culture, men grow these magnificent beards, and they, they do all kinds of things to make them beautiful. They, they trim them, and they comb them, and they, they fashion them. They, they put oil in them so that they smell really nice. This is, a sim- this is a symbol of his vitality and his strength, of his comfort. His lips are lilies dripping liquid myrrh. The lilies referred here speak to... His kingly glory. How glorious were the teachings of Christ. And how sweet were the words which dropped from His lips. It reminds me of when Peter, when everyone left, and Jesus said, are, He turned to His disciples, He says, are you going to go too? And they said, how can we? Because you speak the words of life. His lips drip with honey. It says His hands are rods of gold. This is a symbol of His strength. His body is carved ivory. The Lord Jesus too was a person rich with the deepest sensibilities, and he was moved with great feelings and love for his people. His legs are like pillars of marble. They signify his power to stand and have immovable stability. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. This shows something of an elevated character. Though a man, yet he was now a man glorified in the heights of heaven. His mouth is most sweet. It speaks of certain aspects of his work. Charles Spurgeon said this, talking about this analogy of Jesus and all these characteristics. 
He says, when you get sick and sad and weary of God's people, turn your thoughts to God himself. And if ever you see any spots in the church, Christ's bride, look at her glorious husband. And you will only love him the more as you think of his wondrous condescension and having loved such a poor thing as his church is even at her best. Man. I'm going to have Sam come up here and just play for a minute because there's two things that I want you guys to, to see here tonight. One is that the greatest treasure of marriage is not sex. It is the sweet bond between a man and a woman, about two people, two friends. Remember the, the, the term that's used interchangeably within the text, that he calls her his lover, his sweet friend, in the same way she calls him my lover and my sweet friend. And the Lord refers to both of them as his lovers and his sweet friends. To be in relationship with someone, to be in communion with someone, that is the sweet part. Just like as you get older and you experience more life with Jesus and your relationship with him grows more and more sweet, the same thing is true with a relationship with a spouse. That you grow in intimacy, you grow in, in, in uh, love for that person, not because of their physical connection to you, but because of what they mean to you as a person, as your friend, your dear friend. That's why old, older folks say that, yes, marriage gets better the longer that you're married. If you do it right. Because you grow closer to one another. So many people, they read the Song of Songs and they seem to think it's simply erotic literature, but it's so much deeper than that. What we've seen tonight is this tug and pull between a, a, a woman who has been given an invitation to come be with her man, but he, she has left him at the door. And he is kind and he is waiting. The invitation has been set. For those of you in a relationship or desiring a relationship, you cannot treat your sexuality as a cheap part of your life used for your own self-centered pleasure. You cannot just stay there and just think, oh yes, you know, when the time comes, I'll answer the door. Your sexual integrity matters and it should be built intentionally. Your relationships should be intentional. You should pursue unity with another person, not just because it displays the gospel, because, but because it is a way that God has blessed us to have deep relationships with people. And if we ignore that, if we say, oh, well, I'll cross that bridge when I get there, what happens is you'll find yourself meeting that person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, and you have been a poor steward of your time getting to that relationship. And you realize that you're going to drag all the bad decisions that you've made into that relationship, and then you're going to hurt them along the way as you sort them out. So begin now. If you're not in a relationship, begin now to, to make yourself into the person that is worthy of another son or daughter of heaven. Be intentional. Now, for those of you who need to make your relationship with God right, I have got something else I want to read you. Jesus has giving us, given us a sobering message tonight. As I was going through this lesson, I came to this passage and I thought, oh my goodness, this is, man, this is convicting. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is confronting the church in Laodicea and he says this, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And the one who, who opens the door, I will, I will be with him. You will be more than conquerors. I will grant him to sit with me on, on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the question is this. If you have been walking this line where you are just hanging out, hanging out in your bed of sin, 
You might be a child of heaven. You might be a child of God, and you're playing around. And you're, you're taking your relationship with Jesus for granted. You're thinking, okay, yeah, I'll get to that when I'm a grown-up, whatever the heck that means. I'll take my faith seriously whenever I'm in a relationship or whenever I have a job or whenever I finish school. But for now, I'm just going to play around. Understand that there's a sense of urgency to the gospel. That we do not know the time or the hour that Christ will come back. God forbid, God forbid that we would get to the gates of heaven And that we would realize in a moment, first before they don't say our name, when they issue out the list of all those that belong there, before that even rings in our ears, we would realize that we don't even culturally fit into what's happening inside because we are not his. God forbid that we would take for granted the the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the genuine relationship that he has offered us just because we thought we had all the time in the world. I want you to know this. The getting saved and knowing Jesus is not about going to heaven. That's a perk. That's a benefit. Having a relationship with Jesus, knowing Jesus, being in a relationship with God, it is what you were created to do. The things that you're looking for that you can't seem to to find something that will satisfy you? The reason is because you weren't made to be a companion with that thing. It's just a thing. Jesus stands at the door and he knocks and the invitation is open, but he's not going to barge his way in. He's not going to kick in the door. He's not going to say, okay, now you're mine. You're going to do these things. He says, come answer the door. I'm right here. It could be that you don't know Jesus at all. And I want to invite you I'm not going to tell you to say a prayer because it's not that simple. I mean, it is that simple, but it's not that simple. I want you to talk to me. Come up and talk to me or talk to Matt so that we can explain to you what it means to give your life to Jesus. It is the greatest thing you will ever do. We're going to have a short time. Sam's going to play so we can think about these things. And then I'm going to close us in prayer. And then we'll go to our prayer groups. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you would call us to wake up. To answer the door. Holy Spirit, speak to us. I know that there are some in this room that need you. And they are afraid to acknowledge it. Lord, give us courage. Give us us courage to obey 